Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. Today, April 2nd, we have released our Brute Gymnastics Only program. Since we started in 2014, this has been hands down the most popular and effective part of our training programs for competitors. One thing that I really love that the gymnastics doctor, Nick Sorrell, taught me and, and teaches all of our athletes is we're trying to teach you how to build or, or how to be a carpenter rather than build a birdhouse. On one hand, we could give you the perfect directions on how to build a birdhouse, and you could go out there and execute those plans. If, on the other hand, we teach you how to be a carpenter, then you can build anything you want with precision. What a lot of people do is that they'll teach you how to do a muscle up or a handstand push up. But then when you have to walk on your hands, you have to do other skills, you have to do things under fatigue, you can't do them as well because you don't have the uh, underlying foundation, the fundamentals down. So in our training program, in our gymnastics program, we start by laying a very, very wide base. We teach you the fundamentals of artistic gymnastics as well as gymnastics for the sport of fitness while also doing the higher level skills that you'll be doing that you need to compete that way no matter what the sport throws at you no matter how fatigued you are you can succeed this program is a uh it's a 20 level system you start everyone starts at the same level level one and it is a go at your own pace kind of thing it takes most people about three weeks to get through one level and we've had several d1 gymnasts that have not made it past level 14. so we firmly believe if you can make it through our entire training program you will be hands down the best gymnast in the sport of fitness you can find out more about the program at www.brutestrengthtraining.com backslash brute gymnastics now i've seen people go from on one end of the, of the spectrum go from doing zero pull-ups to being able to do uh, several unbroken butterfly pull-ups and then on the higher end i've seen people go from doing 10 muscle ups in a row to being able to do 18 muscle ups so this is for every uh every different skill level and every different experience level there are three big training sessions per week that last 15 to 25 minutes and there are two supplemental workouts which are gymnastics specific mobility work and then there's one makeup day on saturday again you can find out more about this program at www.brutestrengthtraining.com backslash brute gymnastics today's show is a little bit different i'm joined by the gymnastics doctor nick sorrell the head of brute gymnastics today we're going to tell you all of the ins and outs of the brute gymnastics program just to give you a little bit of background over the past few years hands down the number one thing that our athletes and clients have said they receive the most benefit out of is the gymnastics program over the past year we've been working on a way to make that available to people that are only interested in gymnastics rather than the rest of competitive fitness so this show is all about that program all the ins and outs all the fundamental concepts that went into creating this program and I really think that whether or not you're interested in joining this program, um, it's, a, it's a very valuable 45 minutes of your life. Nick teaches a lot of really fundamental concepts that can be applied to any aspect of sport, gymnastics, or life in general. Enjoy the show. Doc, thanks for joining me again, man. It's an exciting hey. day. Yeah, you're welcome. It's definitely an exciting <laughs> day for you. <laughs> As if on cue. All right, man. So we are releasing the gymnastics program today after probably over a year of hype. Uh, you know, we've been talking about it for a long time and, and it's finally here. It's the Guns N' Roses album of the fitness world. <laughs> Hell yeah. So my goal for this podcast is is twofold. One, I want to I want it to 
explain in detail what to expect out of this program for anyone interested. But for, for anyone that's not interested, I want them to find value from listening just by way of the concepts and the, the kind of way that you set this program up. Um, you have some very good metaphors that I think can be applied not only to people learning gymnastics or sport, but also other areas of life. So the hope is that anyone listening finds a ton of value out of listening to this podcast. So let's start here. How, how is the program, how is this gymnastics program unique? Why can't we just take, you know, why can't we just go to a national level gymnastics coach and <clears throat> take their gymnastics program that has been, you know, developing world champion sh- champions at the Olympics and stuff like that and just give it to CrossFitters? Why, why can't we do that? <clears throat> Yeah, so um, what we've uh, spent or what I've spent a lot of time doing and um, is trying to create a program that applies the same basic principles that you would get from an Olympic level uh, body weight program or, or using the principles of gymnastics, uh, what we call artistic gymnastics, and trying to apply that to CrossFit. So um, I, I think the wonderful thing about brute strength, and this is the thing that's echoed at all of the things we do together, is that this this symbiotic relationship of all of the coaches learning from each other and building on each other. You know, it's a kind of a democratic system in which we all get together and we learn and we're constantly trying to push the envelope on what can truly make people better at um, competitive fitness or really any other goal that they want. Um, So, if you went to, um, and not that there would be anything wrong with it, but you know the idea would be if you went to a gymnastics gym, right, where they do artistic gymnastics, you would certainly gain a lot from that and learn a lot from that. But what their their programs are designed to make you better at just that artistic gymnastics, right, um, and or Olympic style gymnastics. Our goal has been to deconstruct that and make it to where we build on all these different attributes that it would take to be competent at body weight fitness. And then you can apply that to most specifically in our case, competitive fitness, but by having broken it down to all of its individual elements and the absolute basics and being able to dose those appropriately to our athletes, they can use those to do whatever they want. Right? Like, so if we had somebody that was interested in just getting, uh, more fit, at any other sport, right? It, it would, we think that having this base, um, from the program that we've created will, uh, apply along, uh, a wider range of, um, uh, eventualities for what the athlete would want. So one of the fundamental concepts that you use is to explain, like that you use to explain the way that you program is the idea of building a carpenter and not a birdhouse. Can you explain that and how how that might yeah. relate to other yeah, that's, areas? Yeah, that's my, like my favorite analogy. Now I can't like uh, I can't give any talk without saying that now, <laughs> but but I love it. I, I think uh, uh, when I uh, when I thought of that, I was like, it's perfect. It's exactly what I, one of those things where you always thought of something a certain way, but you didn't know how to um, uh, to get it out. And, but but this the idea is that when um, you know when we first started coaching. CrossFit or I first started coaching CrossFit athletes, I would think in terms of like different moves, like how do I get people better at doing a, you know, a a ring muscle up or whatever, or how do I get people better at doing a different trick? And then, you know, and then that taught them just that it taught them how to do that trick. Uh, and then we, then, uh, give me an example of that. What do you mean? Like, um, so if I had, uh, you know, so if you take a skill, uh, that, is say very similar like uh, a bar say a bar muscle up and then a back up rise on the bar so a bar muscle up being you come from an arched front swing and then you collapse your body towards the bar and you uh, rise above the bar if you uh, if you do competitive fitness it's obviously something you're familiar with and a back up rise comes from a hollow front swing and then you swing back and pull down on the bar. So if I ask a CrossFitter or, or a competitive fitness athlete to do a bar muscle up, if they, they can probably do one, right? Because that's something that uh, is prescribed a lot in competitive fitness. But then if you showed them a bar uh, back up rise, which is very similar, and if you had 
all of the body attributes, including the coordination uh, and the strength to do a bar muscle up, you should very easily be able to do a back up rise, right? But if I showed them a back up rise, they would, you know, most CrossFitters would be like, what is that? I can't do that. That's ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and then you could pick any other number of analogies to where um, something, a skill that took similar coordination, similar mobility, and similar strength, they can if the competitive fitness athlete that trains just to complete that one task can't perform that other skill, so basically their skills aren't transferable or translatable because they're just practicing all the attributes in aggregate as, as one skill, right? So, but then if you broke down the skill into um, its components, if you broke down it into pulling, if you broke it down into um, – uh, into swinging, if you broke it down into the different mobility and uh, positions that it takes to maintain that skill, then we find that those skills are transferable. And so the analogy with the birdhouse and the carpenter thing is if you have a guy and you give him um, a blueprint to build a birdhouse, then any layman can build that, right? If you take enough time, you may screw up a few times with that birdhouse. If the instructions are right, you'll eventually get that birdhouse. Mm -hmm. But then you go ask him to build a doghouse, right? Oh, well, where are my instructions? I don't know how to do that. But if you have a carpenter, he can he can hammer a nail and he can saw and he knows how to measure and he knows how. And so that carpenter can build whatever you ask him to. So the analogy, uh, I really like that analogy from a coaching standpoint, because that's what I want my athletes to be able to do. I don't want to just teach them one trick and then have them like not and then not give them the skill and the capacity to go and do something else and perform something else. And what happens if they are that higher level competitive fitness athlete and they're at uh, the, the CrossFit games or something and they bring out the, <laughs> they bring out the pegboard, right. Or they bring mm -hmm. out the, whatever it is. And then their skills aren't transferable because that ultimately that's the whole thing with the uh, CrossFit, especially, you know, and, and it's wonderful. They talk about the unknown and unknowable, which is great. Um, but for a large part, a lot of that unknown and unknowable has been pretty freaking known, <laughs> you know, like, but, and, and, and not to CrossFit detriments, but the detriment of the community, that we serve and that we keep seeing, oh, all, what they do is they program bar muscle ups. So let's make people do a bunch of bar muscle ups, right? But, you know, if you have, um, you know, the head, uh, the, you know, head coach of, you know, uh, Bill Belichick doesn't teach people how to score touchdowns, right? He teaches people how to run plays and he mm -hmm. teaches people how to tackle and he teaches people how to uh, run routes, right? So it's breaking these things down into the different elements on a micro level that can, uh, transfer to any number of skills. I see a, a t-shirt coming out of this, like hashtag be the carpenter <laughs> by Nick yeah, Sorrell. Yeah. Um, Mike, I'm going to be honest. I think we can do better than that, but I like where your head is at. I'm I think we can. Th yeah. We, this is a, this is a kind of a small release. You know, we make, make a hundred or, or however yeah. many we want and just get that out into the world. <laughs> And see how it goes. We got, I mean, we have a whole team of people that are, uh, that are good, really good at hashtags, but I think there's one. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We got, we get, we got we get little it. people thinking of, thinking of hashtags out there we, right now. We got little people thinking of big things out there. Yeah. Another, we'll get our, <laughs> we got brain trust on it. Another one of the driving concepts in the way that you program is practicing is this idea of practicing with perfect form. So that when you get tired, you're kind of, you fall back onto slightly less than perfect form, right? How does this, yeah. so why is it important that, why is this important? Even though we see, um, you know, top level athletes in competition with less than perfect form. It mainly comes down to uh, body awareness, uh, two things that I like to talk about. One is body awareness and Two is having more tools in your toolbox. So, um, uh, so talking about the first part of that with the body awareness, um, if you uh, the weightlifting thing is probably the best analogy, you know, because anytime anybody fails a snatch, they'll stop and they'll be like, ah, you know, I didn't, I wasn't in triple extension, or my, hip, you know, hips did this, and all, and <clears throat> people become very attuned to what their body was doing because they get really mad that they didn't achieve that rep and rightfully so. Um, and, but you know, in gymnastics, it's uh, very similar, but we don't often think of it that way. Um, and that, uh, it, you, if you do a, a repetition and 
it was performed and you did it in a way that for your body made it more efficient um, and made you complete the repetition better or even just made you complete the repetition at all, then remembering what your body form was doing at that time helps you to replicate that and reproduce it. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be pretty. Now, very often, it just so happens that pretty form is the most efficient form when you look at it from a physics standpoint. But um, what we want to do when we're practicing is we want our athletes to practice with straight legs or if their legs are bent, they're bent on purpose and basically recognizing what they were doing. Because if not, if you're not recognizing what you're doing, how are you going to grow and um, and learn what worked and what didn't and become more efficient? Um, so that's that reason. Um, and then the other reason, like having more tools in your toolbox is uh, probably a good example of this is handstand walking. Uh, people ask me, well, what's the beta, best way to handstand walk? You know, should your body be arched or, or, or should your body be in a hollow position? And if you're listening to this potty, podcast and you've done competitive fitness, you probably know what I'm talking about. Arch position, meaning your back is extended. Hollow position, meaning your chest and your stomach is sucked in a little bit. Um, you know, or people will say, or should I do it with my legs flailing about, you know, like some people do the bicycle kick when I'm walking on my hands. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you ask the average uh, uh, competitive fitness athlete to walk on their hands, they basically only have one way they can do it, right? They can mm -hmm. kick up and if they know how to walk on their hands arched, they can walk on their hands arched. Or if they only know how to do it flailing their legs, they'll do it that way. But if you ask a, a gymnast to do it, they can, they can try all three different ways. Like I can very easily kick up on my hands and I can try to walk arched. I can try to walk hollow. I can try to walk kicking my legs and then I can see what feels best for me. I don't only have one tool in my toolbox and there's other examples like with muscle ups, we teach basically four different or I can think of five different ways to do a muscle up that all meet the range of most motion requirements of, of CrossFit. Um, and uh, in all of those different ways, uh, tax your body a little bit differently, um, use different skills and attributes. And actually, very commonly in a workout, um, I'll switch from one to another. Some of our real, our higher level athletes that have been working with me a while, a great example is George Sanchez. Um, he's really taken that to heart and he can do muscle up several different ways. And, you know, to the layman, you might not notice the small uh, it differences in the way he's doing a ring muscle up. But the reality is he will very intentionally switch the way he is doing muscle ups. Like say if his arms are fatigued, he'll switch his form to another type of form. If his um, systemic endurance and his breathing is fatigued, then he'll switch to a different type and he can do that. And so um, now is that going to you know, turn you from a non-regional athlete to a regional athlete or is that going to turn you from a non-podium competitor to a podium competitor? I don't know, but the reality is if you're looking for every little advantage and stone unturned and you truly want to be excellent um, at, at your craft, then uh, that's something that you can't ignore. It's funny that we that there's that this isn't more widely accepted in the community yet. It's just so it's so apparent that that people in every other sport do things this way. And it just hasn't, you know, CrossFit is such a young sport that it just hasn't caught on yet, right? Like uh, a football player is going to learn the absolute perfect way to throw a ball and they're going to learn that for 20, 30, 40 years, however long they're playing ball, right? Uh, right. They're going to learn how, you know, the, the proper footwork. They're going to learn, you know, different types of footwork, um, different types of drops. They're going to learn... Um, you know, what, what to do with their eyes, like just, just a million different things rather than just throw a ball more, right? Yeah. They're going to learn the absolute perfect way so that when they have a, a defensive end coming in at them, at, you know, at a hundred miles an hour, weighing a hundred more pounds in them, then they have some, they have this muscle memory built up. They have the repetition, the kinesthetic yep. awareness to, you know, keep good form even if not perfect form. Yeah, I, I don't think you could find one person, uh, a good example of somebody that's at the highest echelon at what they do, uh, you know, whether it be a quarterback, a coach, or anything that doesn't uh, say that very thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's everywhere. You know, every single person that you hear talk, they just talk about the basics and being absolutely the best at repeating and perfecting the basics of what you do in every single task. I mean, you're, you're right. And uh, yeah, and I don't know what it is. I don't think it's anything 
anything about CrossFit in general. I think CrossFit in general, I like the base and what they teach, uh, you know, is, you know, they have the thing about not being virtuous and, and, and tasks. And, and so I, I, I don't know, but what I do, what I do believe strongly is that, um, that we have this tendency because I know that I've done it too as I'm a coach and an athlete is to just walk in the gym and get involved in that passion of like I want to just go out and do these reps and do all this kind of stuff right and I want to and we were talking about it before we got on this podcast I've you know recently taken a step back at and at our, from our brute last brute retreat you know we sit there and we have all these wonderful coaches and people and you know we have a d and sean and ken shaw and i mean everybody just talking about these very pr- basic principles that have building your foundation and i'm like yeah and i'm preaching it but that's not what i was doing i was going into the gym i was uh, you know i'm like i barely ever get to go to the gym and then when i get to go to the gym i go and i hit a crossfit wad and i throw some weights around and i jump up and down on one foot and whatever and then I just felt like crap, you know, at the last and I, you know, at, at the last retreat. And I was just like, wait, why do I feel like a million pounds whenever I try to do these muscle ups and things like that? And then I got back home and I was like, well, let me I think and it was like a light bulb went off. I was like, I just heard all these really smart and awesome coaches talk about all this stuff. And I was saying this stuff. Maybe I should try it. And so for the last six weeks, I've basically been going back and doing all of the basics. Right. Every once in a while, I do a CrossFit wad for fun. And, and they're, they're great. CrossFit wads are great. But like I'm, you know, focusing on my nutrition, my mobility, I'm focusing on doing, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the very small gymnastics drills and holds and things like that, uh, pull ups. And, and, and I just I haven't felt this good in a very long time, you know. Hell yeah. I love it, man. Um, and just to be clear, we what what we teach in this gymnastics program is the fundamentals but in the actual programming we also incorporate what what he's calling gymnastics wads because people that are interested in this type of program yeah. want to compete in the sport of fitness and the sport aspect of it is more important than any other piece what we're advocating for is just more a little bit more emphasis on learning the fundamentals, mastering the basics so that you basically build a wider base to make a taller pyramid, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So let, let's go into kind of some of the specifics of the program. You have this, um, these four characteristics of a successful progression, logical, linear, personalized, and incorporable. What, what, tell us a little bit about each of those and how it relates to the program. So the logical and linear kind of go uh, hand in hand. It's, uh, you know, a program has to be uh, logical and, and the things that should go first go first and the things that should go second go second. So uh, so logical, logically, you should be doing a headstand before you doing a handstand push up the same way. Logically, you should be doing an air squat before you're doing a squat snatch, you know. Logically, you should be able to do a pull up uh, or X number of pull ups before you can do a ring muscle up. Um, and then linear, meaning you continue to march along those lines, going advancing from smallest skill to um, uh, or least difficult skill to most difficult task. Um, personalized, meaning you can do it at your own pace. You know, that's one of the most challenging things as a coach, I think. And I think that's the. Um, uh, that's the, what's the word, the golden ring or the brass ring or whatever. Like that's what we're all striving for is how to, uh, program for a global audience, but at the same time provide a way to give all of these individual bodies and individual needs and that are just such an infinite variability. Um, how do we give attention to that? Right. You know, um, and so, uh, the idea with the um, the personalization of our program is that you progress at your own pace um, and that it's a level system that builds your base that um, it that that allows you to go from the easiest skill and not advancing beyond that until you can achieve that skill and allows you to do that at your own pace. And it's incorporable because each individual segment or each individual workout is, is pretty short. 
uh, and it's not too taxing. It's about 10 to 15 minutes per workout and you can fit it into a larger program that has other training goals and you can afford to spend 10, 15 minutes a day, maybe 20 minutes at the most on doing these tasks um, and fitting that in there um, and uh, still achieving the other goals you want to do. We don't want to spend so much time doing gymnastics basics that you never, you know, do your weightlifting anymore, you know, or that you even never spend time doing uh, muscle up, you know, for uh, reasons you mentioned, you know, you still need to do that kind of stuff. But the idea is you will be a lot better at doing that stuff if you spend um, this segment and amount of time doing the uh, doing the basics. Enjoying this episode? Hit subscribe. We have more amazing content for you every single week. The next Brute Strength Athlete Camp is on April 14th and 15th in Miami, Florida. These camps are for athletes and coaches that want to learn about mindset, endurance, gymnastics, weightlifting, and general physical preparedness. It's also for athletes of all skill levels. So whether you're still working on your first pull-up or you can do 20 muscle-ups in a row, this camp is for you. The, the feedback that we've gotten on these camps is really overwhelming. People are having huge breakthroughs in their physical performance, but the feedback that we're getting more than anything else is on what people are learning in terms of mindset. We really drill concepts and tactical practices that you can implement into your training and your life that are going to help you build a stronger mind. The flow of the day goes like this. It's lecture breakout group, lecture, breakout group, over and over and over so that you're not doing any one thing for too long. And we break people out into small groups so that everyone gets as much individual attention as possible. If you're interested in learning more, you can go to brutestrengthtraining.com backslash athlete hyphen retreat. That's brutestrengthtraining.com backslash athlete hyphen retreat. Hope to see you there. This episode is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox sends you boxes of meat to your doorstep every month or two months. These are 100% grass-fed, raised, and finished animals, and they are never treated with any antibiotics. I made a conscious decision this year to choose quality over quantity, so quality of movement, quality of relationships, and quality of my food choices. And regarding the food choices, I know that the decisions I make today are going to affect me when I'm 70, 80, 90 years old. And I don't, I don't want to wait until it's too late to start making the right decisions. So I know that I'm going to be eating meat regardless of what diet I'm following at any given, at any given time. So it's best to choose the highest quality meat I can find. And I know that convenience is a high priority to me. And that's what butcher box does they send the highest quality meat right to my door and it's some of the best meat i've ever tasted literally the ground meat they send is better than most conventional steaks that you'll find in a grocery store grass-fed meat also has higher levels of vitamins and minerals and there's more protein per ounce of meat some more benefits are that it helps reduce cellular inflammation it improves brain function and it allows you to absorb the nutrients in the meat better into your cells. It also has higher levels of CLA. With higher levels of CLA, you're gonna have improvements in your metabolism, which is gonna make it easier for you to burn fat. It's gonna improve your blood sugar levels, help you fight cancer, and even reduce your risk of heart disease. You can check out all of the packages and even get a sweet deal at butcherbox.com backslash brute. And again, you get a free pack of bacon and $20 off your first order. Another thing that I consider when shopping for meat is the ethics of the company. And this is absolutely not something I'm perfect with. It's just something I'm trying to cultivate more in my life. In my first semester of college, I had a hippy dippy uh, professor that showed us the documentary Food Inc. And at the time, I grew up in Louisiana. I didn't even know a single vegetarian, much less consider it. After watching that video, I became a vegetarian for six full months. And over time, I just kind of lost sight of that, that feeling and that motive that I had to become a vegetarian. And so I started to eat conventional meat. 
and now I'm trying to get back into eating animal protein that was, uh, you know, of animals that were treated properly, happy Zen animals. And so really I just sleep well at night knowing that I'm eating meat from animals that weren't treated like a piece of shit right there. These animals are all pasture raised. Um, I don't know if they enjoy it, but it seems like a much better life to me than living in a cage and treated with a bunch of antibiotics and all of that kind of shit. So it just gives me a little bit of peace of mind knowing that I'm eating animals that were treated a little bit better. Again, you can find out more about the packages and get the sweet deal at butcherbox.com backslash brute. You'll get a free pack of bacon at $20 off your first order. Go through the actual structure of the program and why it's laid out the way it is. Like what, what does a week look like? And, uh, and also talk to the kind of general structure of say the first 10, 20 levels. So, uh, each level has the, um, uh, is dosed, uh, or has the same doses of the same attributes. So what I mean is we have our gymnastics, uh, attributes that we're trying to build in all our athletes include strength. Um, they include, uh, static positioning, meaning being able to hold different positions that you need to recreate to get through different movements. Um, uh, they have dynamic movement, which is going from one position to another, like a archer or a hollow or a swing or whatever, kicking up to a handstand. So basically moving into the right position. Um, and, uh, those are broken down even further, you know, it's uh, just to briefly review the, the, the dynamic is broken down in between bar, uh, rings and, uh, floor, which is handstands essentially for our purposes. And then the static positioning is things that are holds and, uh, hang, excuse me, hangs. And, uh, so hanging from a structure and holding a position or things that are support, supporting yourself and holding a position. Um, and then strength is core strength, pulling strength and pushing strength. And then we also, uh, break those down even further. And I have lots of stuff out there on this and I, you can, um, I won't go into all the details, but each of those elements is in every level. So you can't, if you spend a month on a level, you're not going to go a whole month without doing core strength. Right. And so there's actually going to be two core elements. There's going to be two of each of those strength elements and everything. There's going to be two dynamic elements and then there's going to be two, at least two static elements. So all each one of those things, are going to require uh, mastery before you move on. So say if on a particular level um, your pulling strength is you have to be able to master doing um, five pull-ups every minute on the minute for X number of minutes, then you're going to have to master that before you move on. Um, and those, all of those things are mixed together in little workouts. So you'll have, say, uh, in your workout, say if it, you'll have workout one, and workout one will show up and it'll be you have to do um, pull ups, you have to do uh, support hold on rings and you have to do um, a swing on the bar. Right. And so each each of those elements will have a criteria to say, I have done this well enough to master it. Uh, and they have three levels that you progress through typically. So say on the first week, I'll try, I'll do this number of swings and this number of pull-ups. The next week I'll do this number and the next week I'll do this number. And if by the third week you've mastered that and you've achieved that, then you've mastered that workout. And so that's one workout. Um, each level has three workouts. Um, and so say on Monday, you'll have workout one on Wednesday, you'll have workout, t uh, two and on Thursday, you'll have workout three. By the time you've done all three of those workouts, you'll have done all of those different things that I've mentioned. So there won't be any gaps in your program that's well-rounded so that you have achieved all of the pushing, pulling, static strength, and all the, uh, everything, all of these different elements in between there. So typically on Tuesdays. In Thursdays, I believe, or um, sometimes we'll do on Saturdays, which you'll have supplements that you can do. Um, and then the supplements are things that you don't have to master and, and uh, this demonstrate that you can uh, do well and achieve. But they're just supplement like uh, your mobility um, and other revisiting previously learned skills and things like that. Um, so it's, uh, you know, just like it sounds, supplemental work. Does that make sense? You probably, I'm sure it makes sense to you because you know the program. But <laughs> it yes, sense it actually does. Um, That's good. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. So hey, if it doesn't make sense to you, there's just something gone terribly wrong. Right. 
will people forget oh. how to like in this process this you know what you just talked about are are is the are the fundamentals right those are the those are the base of the pyramid but right, so as we discussed very early on like people are, they compete all year long and they need to be they're doing their crossfit workouts all year long on top of this and they need to be able to do the high level movement so how do we prepare athletes for that and prevent them from forgetting how to do muscle ups yeah, while, so, while we're building um, those those fundamentals. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so uh, just like you mentioned uh, before in the uh, preface of the last question was, uh, you know, you basically don't do a muscle up until level. I think it's 10. It's either 10 or 11. But I think it's 10. Um, and uh, yeah, so you we need to have our athletes doing that stuff. Um, now, if you can't do a muscle up at all, it's a great way to build up towards a muscle up. Right. But if you're already a competitive fitness athlete and you need to and you want to compete at a higher level, you need to be practicing more often. Right. Um, the, uh, the same way that, you know, while, uh, you know, you're all practicing running, uh, drills in uh, football, you're also running scrimmages, you know, so you need to be, uh, incorporating those basics into a higher level task as well. Um, and so what we do, um, is we have, uh, we've been doing this with our, uh, brute compete and our brute games prep, our regular brute program athletes for a while. But throughout the week, we'll give them doses of uh, CrossFit or, or competitive fitness style Metcons, um, different skill sessions. Metcons. And with the- <laughs> uh, yeah, why did I just get all, uh, say that all douchey like that? I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Every once in a while, I do that. I'll come to uh, that from you. Yeah, thanks, man. Um, so- <laughs> Yeah, I need some new friends. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, we'll uh, throw different Metcons and WADs and things like that that will incorporate those. So, so it does a couple of things. One, it breaks the monotony and it's fun, right? Um, and uh, it, it kind of reinvigors that that passion for doing competitive fitness, not just like grinding out the basics all the time. Um, and then uh, it also just – allows you to incorporate those things and it see those gains and incorporate those skills you're working. Um, whenever we're programming those, we typically do one day a week. That's like a really long skill session, you know, basically 30 to 45 minutes of non really taxing work, but, uh, to where you do a whole bu- you do a lot of basics, but then you also throw in some higher level skills and it's just a whole day of just doing a bunch of skills. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we'll have, uh, Three or four days a week, we'll have those other kind of metcons where at certain cycles of the year, it'll be mainly like uh, progressions of uh, doing a lot more uh, pulling strength and pushing strength and things like that, like a building part of your meso cycle. And then um, then at other times in the year, it'll be putting that all together and doing more like, Hey, let's just do, let's do more bar muscle ups. Let's do more ring muscle ups. Let's do more handstand push ups. So that's where, um, that element of the program, um, is where we take those basics and, you know, um, we take our ability to tackle and our ability to throw and we take our ability to run routes and we turn that into a play, right? We turn that into a, uh, something that's uh, functional and useful in the competitive fitness world. Mm-hmm. Have there been any, yeah, what have been the most common kind of questions that people have about the program in terms of um, when, when is it com- when is it coming out? That's the most common yeah, right? question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's definitely the most common question. No, but once no, they're uh, once they're on it, what are kind of the <laughs> where, where do people get stuck? Um, let me. I will say this, man. When I, when I first uh, came out with this, um. Uh, actually, I think I sent you and Matt Bruce an email and said, this is my Mona Lisa. You know, I don't even know if you guys really knew I was working on this, but I just had this idea and I just mm-hmm. rolled with it and I sent it to y'all. And uh, when I did, at first I had this really long spreadsheet of like how people would progress through any every level. And if they got stuck on something, how they would like go back and then what else they could do. And because I was worried that when people – were one, they would get frustrated doing the basics over and over again. And two, they would get extremely frustrated whenever they got stuck on something for a while. Mm -hmm. And what I have been extremely like surprised and just really in awe of our athletes, uh, is that 
we don't see a whole lot of that, like barely any actually of people that get frustrated with the process and say, oh, I just want to quit doing it just because I can't do it anymore. Or we'll have people that are be on the same level for months. And I mean months. Mm -hmm. And they will still like love the process of continue to get better. And it gives them that other goal. Like they'll be stuck on a couple of different skills and they will just work harder and harder until they get those skills. And what that does is, is it makes you more well-rounded. It doesn't let you move on and be fickle, right? There's a lot of fickleness in our, in us as people. Um, and it allows us to be more disciplined in what we're doing, saying we are not going to move on until we have uh, mastered this. Um, so, but that being said, the most common questions I get are when people are stuck on those one or two different things, right? And mm -hmm. so they're typically like skill related questions. Like, uh, and what it does, it'll point out something to somebody. And I'm not saying my system's perfect. Like, it may, you know, it's not a scientific method. I mean, it's logical, but it's not. But like, say, there are some things that I know are the sticking points, you know. And if I went back and I recreated the program, which one, one of these years we may overhaul it and rewrite some of the things, and it'll be, but. There are certain sticking points that I know people get stuck at, like the pulls to invert on level one are a really hard part. Um, some of the planche holes, I believe on level five or level six, um, they're very brief little planche holes, but it's those positions. But those are the things that that really, although they're sticking points for people, um, those are – and I commonly get a lot of questions about it. How can I get better at this and help me move on? What it has pointed out is like these – the gaps in some of our athletes' abilities – Right. And common gaps in like the same way. So Sean uh, Passage with Active Life right now, he's got me on a program where I'm doing more uh, upward scapular rotation because uh, I was having a ton of pain in my shoulder. And it turns out my ability to downward rotate my scapula or basically like do dips was vastly superior to my ability to upwardly rotate. And just doing that over a short period of time, my shoulder pain is almost gone, you know? And so the analogy is in, gym, in these gymnastics movements, we have people that can do bent arm pulling like crazy, but they can't straight arm pull, right? And those are equally as important in, in what we're trying to accomplish for competitive fitness. And so you put them on level one and all of a sudden they've got to keep their arms straight and pull themselves upside down. And they're like, holy shit, <laughs> what happened? You know? Yeah. And so, so I get easy. Yeah, and it looks easy. And they're like, okay, I'll just pull myself upside down. They're like, no, wait, hold on, I can't do that. Um, and so I think that's the biggest questions that I get, but it's probably the best thing about the program. Is that it forces you to master each piece before moving on. Right, and not and not ignoring certain elements. Like, ah, I'm just not good at that. Right. No, well, you need to be good at that. If Because okay. if you want to do bar muscle ups, you've got to be able to pull on the bar with, you know, pull straight down on the bar. Yeah, I, I want to highlight this. So... A lot of people believe that once you can do something like a muscle up or a handstand push up, then to be able to do more of them, then you should just do more of them. And mm. we, we've kind of talked about the, you know, we've already talked about the carpenter versus birdhouse analogy, but to, to kind of take an even different angle, like why, why is that not why is that not the best logic? If, if, you know, we, I already know how to do a muscle up and I already know how to do a handstand push up. Why can't I just do more of those in order to yeah. reach my full potential? Right. So this, uh, so then my follow up question, if somebody asks, really asked me that would be like, if I want to be an Olympic level weightlifter, why do I need to squat? Mm -hmm. Why do I need to squat once a week? Why don't I just do power clean and squat cleans all day long? Yeah, right So it's completely if you even beyond just like the um, the uh, the philosophy of, of mastering the basics, right? Which, like you said, we've already uh, talked about ad nauseum. Uh, just from a physiologic and muscle adaptation standpoint, there's only so many. If you can do, okay, if you can stress your body and do seven muscle ups, right? Let's just say you can do seven muscle ups, but you can do 25 pull ups. How much, you know, and you can do tempo pull ups and you can do weighted pull ups, but you can't do all that kind of stuff with muscle ups. You have so many more ways that you can adapt and uh, cause muscle adaptation by stressing your body in different ways and loading your body and loading the movement of pulling, of bent arm pulling, than by just doing muscle ups, right? Mm -hmm. And then the one thing that we ignore a lot is what is the manner in which we're pulling? So for pull ups, if I'm writing a muscle up program, most of the pulling I'm doing is I'm doing getting people to do a lot of 
bent arm pulling from a mobile surface, which means ring rows, ring pull-ups, um, rope pull-ups, and things like that. So we're, do, call, we're causing specific adaptations by, um, by loading the components of that movement appropriately. And then, you know, ring rows are not a scaling exercise, right? Ring rows are a phenomenal exercise. They're an excellent exercise. Um, and we'll have people, and you can load those and, all, and deload them in different ways by having to do uh, weighted, by having to do them kipping by uh, using their hips and then tempo and all these different things. Um, and so like for me, uh, an example from my own life, honestly, the time in my life we could not, when I could probably do the most strict muscle ups in a row was not when I was doing CrossFit It's when I first came to CrossFit and I had been doing P90X for <laughs> to, like, uh, basically like two cycles before I came to that. And that's not a knock against CrossFit and for P90X, but the reality is I was good at that because that's all I was doing. Mm-hmm. All I was doing was pull-ups and dips and push-ups. And so I could come to the, I, when I first came to CrossFit, I jumped on the rings and I had probably hadn't done a muscle up in, I don't know, uh, five to 10 years. And the last time I had walked into a gym and I walked in and I could do probably, I think it was like 12 to 15 strict muscle ups, um, like pretty easily. And, and, but the way that I did that wasn't by having done a bunch of muscle ups. The way that I was able to do that was because before I had done a bunch of pull-ups and a bunch of uh, a bunch of a bunch of push-ups and, and and dips and things like that. So um, just from a strict physiological muscle adaptation standpoint, it's better with these compound movements to work the components of the movements uh, to get the most um, uh, adaptation and and, uh, and um, muscle gains. Notice, guys, how he weaseled in the, I could do 12 to 15 <laughs> yeah. muscle-ups pretty easy. <laughs> I know. I, was, I didn't want to, it was actually probably closer to 20, but I didn't want to like. Yeah, but, I love it. You know, I don't want to be like a braggart, you know. So. Yeah. I was actually, I was texting a guy this morning that was a, he's one of the best 200-meter uh, sprinters in the world. His name is Leroy Dixon. He was on the 4x100 team that won the uh the the four by 100 at the last olympics they beat the jamaicans and I, I said i'm doing this i'm doing this podcast together and we have this issue in our community and i told him about the whole muscle up thing and he told me running the two so his event is the 200 meter right mm-hmm. um running the 200 meter is less than 10 percent of his total volume per week so like that's his event and less than 10% of what he does is actually running a 200 meter race, right? Everything right. else is starts or distance or footwork or a million different things, right? A, a million different fundamental things that all play a part in him competing at his event. So it just, it just highlights how every sport has some some essence of what we're talking about um, where you can't just do the one technique or skill that you're, that you're trying to compete in. You have to, um, support it in a million different ways to reach your full potential. So right. and then, one, one thing that I okay. often tell people is sure you could do a bunch of muscle ups and you might be able to do 15 in a row. Right. But at some point you're going to hit, hit a ceiling and by breaking it down and learning the fundamentals and doing it correctly, you're, you're just raising that ceiling. So when you used to be only able to do 15, now you're able to do 20 or 25. So it's just increasing the size of that, like that, the base of that pyramid. Right. I think that, and the, um, it's a little bit off of that topic, but the challenging thing that, and the thing that I love about brute strength is, you know, there's just so many things that you can do and there's only so much your body can do and only so many hours in the day. Right. So the art of all this thing is being able to take all of these different components and dose them appropriately for people and put them in uh, compartmentalize them in a way that they can do it, you know? And so I think, um, one reason maybe why within our community uh, people are just like, well, just do more muscle ups and bar, do bar muscle ups is because people don't either have the time or resources to make a concise and um, uh, a concise and potent and uh, efficient program that will do the things that we're talking about, right? Um, and so it's easier to just say, go do more muscle ups. Um, 
So, uh, but the thing I love about our community and brute strength is we have all these people working together and Nick Fowler orchestrating this whole giant operation of putting those things together in a way that, uh, are that athletes can, um, uh, get better, uh, or, or can, can actually utilize and, uh, um, and get a lot out of. So. Nice. I like how you ended in a so. I was like, <laughs> done. I appreciate that. <laughs> I was, I was gonna. Uh, I need like a, a sign off, like over, you know, or like, uh, you know, like a little. Oh, and, like, just yep. ending a. Ch- yep. Yeah. All right. What? So what? What? What can people expect from this program? What? Are, what are they going to? Just to wrap it up. What are they going? What can they expect to learn and be able to do? as a result of this program? Just being more virile, uh, smelling better, um, better, uh, better tan, uh, dental hygiene, just pretty much everything that you would want out of life. So, uh, uh, yeah, I like that. Anything else? Oh, you mean like, uh, gymnastics? Yeah. What we else can add that. Yeah. Oh, so. yeah, what else do you need other than that? Well, I don't know what else you would need besides those other things I just mentioned. But uh, no, if you um, – to t- when you do it um, – I mean the thing is is that we've been doing this uh, three years now, Mike. Yep. Um, and exactly. and uh, the results that we've seen are, have been really, really good, uh, and I've been uh, very pleased with it, which is why you know I said earlier that at some point maybe there will be an overhaul and I'll go back and I'll fix some things. And I, again, I'm not in any way saying this is perfect or it doesn't need fixing, but it just – we haven't – um, had to go back and do that just because we've been getting such good results with our athletes. And the results that we're seeing is our athletes are uh, more easily coachable, um, you know, and they are learning things more on their own. Um, they're achieving, you know, by doing the basics, they're achieving other higher level skills and other tasks that, uh, uh, that they couldn't do before. Um, and so, if you, you know, the kind of person that would sign for this program is, uh, you know, and would be somebody that really wants to pay attention to, um, to the details and the, uh, importance of really, uh, being, uh, taking the time and effort to being truly good at what you do, you know, and that's what we're all about. And again, I'm not going to say that our mind's the best program or anything like that, but it is for the person of the mindset that if you're going to do something, you're going to do that shit right, basically, you know, and you're going to not want to leave any stone unturned. You're going to want to um, not just go out and do random things, right? You're going to want to be disciplined and know why you're doing something. And if you're doing something, you're doing it to get the absolute most out of your time and effort. Uh, that's, that's what, that's what we're all about. Hell yeah, brother. Appreciate it. It's been a long time coming. Anything else you want to leave these guys with before we sign off? Man, uh, uh, just stay in school. Um, <laughs> nice. do, do the right thing, you know, Lo- love, love people. Um, what else is inspiring that people say? That's, that's uh, just straight wisdom. Nothing, don't, nothing else, doc. Don't, don't punch people for no reason. Uh, shine your shoes. I don't know, Mike. That's about all I got. No, that's good. I, I think that's a good place to stop. Shine your I shoes. Ended, yeah, I ended on shine your shoes. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, Let us know if you have any questions. If not, we're excited to start working with you. Nick, thanks for your time, brother. All right, Mike. I love you. Love you. Later. This episode is finished, but your training journey continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW and grab your free pack of 32 accessory workouts that you can incorporate into your training and start improving your strength immediately. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com slash SSW.